I literally had just done a bodybuilding show, so I was in the best shape of my life. I was making good money. Everything seemed like it was awesome, but I was very unconfident. I had a very low level of self-esteem. I had a very low level of self-worth. I was very self-conscious. I wasn't proud of who I was, and I was afraid of my own shadow, genuinely. And that was a really challenging time for me because I had to look in the mirror and realize I didn't like who I was as a man. Money does not buy happiness. Money buys opportunity. It can buy you time. It can buy you some freedom, but it's not going to fill any voids inside of you. That is something that only you can do. And I, I think a lot of us, Alan, when we're born, we're born into soil that might be toxic. We have no control over it. And five, 10, 15, 20 years later, our roots are still planted in that soil and we're still part of that seed. Welcome everyone to the Revolutionary Man podcast. I'm the founder of The Awakened Man and your host, Alan DeMonso. Each of us encounters struggles in life. There's just no avoiding it. But what happens when you seemingly have everything you could ever want, yet you're still not feeling fulfilled? What then? Well, depending on where you're at mentally and emotionally, it could be something that you just push through, or worse yet, could push you to contemplating ending it all. Well, folks, today my guest is going to share his story of almost ending it all to then creating a life that is filled with meaning, purpose, and power. And before we get into all that, I just want to remind you to hit like, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform so you can stay updated on the latest podcast information and help me grow this Awakened Man message. And for that, I just want to say I'm truly grateful. Let's get on with today's episode. The average man today is sleepwalking through life, many never reaching their true potential let alone ever crossing the finish line to living a purposeful life. Yet, the hunger still exists, albeit buried amidst his cluttered mind, misguided beliefs, and values that no longer serve him. It's time to align yourself for greatness. It's time to become a revolutionary man. Stay strong, my brother. As you know, it's always customary to start off with a couple of questions just to help us set the stage for today's discussion. So when was the last time that you felt down and out, you know, where life had little to no meaning? And did you contemplate ending it all? I know these are hard questions. And I know that because we need to, we really need to have a hard conversation about this. And for many men, we just don't care to do that. And then because we don't want to do that, we end up by struggling. Now there's lots of reasons and none of them are really good. So what are you, what are you going to do instead? Well, today, my guest, Kevin Palmieri discusses his life struggles and his successes and how he's transformed his life and his take has been able to take consistent action. So allow me to introduce Kevin. Some people find rock bottom, he says, but Kevin found out that rock bottom also has a, ba- has a basement. And in his mid twenties, he found out he had it. He thought he had had it all. He had a beautiful girlfriend, a high paying job, a sports car, a dream body. And with all of this perceived success, he found himself still sitting on the edge of his bed, debating suicide. Not once, but several times. But years later, Kevin and his business partner founded Next Level University, which features, among other things, a podcast that generates multiple six figures, has hundreds of thousands of downloads, and is in over 100 countries. Welcome to the show, Kevin. How are things today? I am living the dream, Alan. Thank you for the wonderful intro. I'm excited to chat with you and and see where we go for the listeners today. Yeah, I'm really grateful for reaching out today. And you know, in all of, in the men's work that we do here with the Awakened Man, we always talk about all of us being on a hero's journey. You know, the the idea that we're always on some form of a quest. And so, I like to start off by asking my guests on the show is tell us a little bit about your journey, your quest, and how that shaped you and led you to who you are today and the thing and the work that you do. Absolutely. So, I always start my story with a little bit of context. So, I was raised by my mom and my grandmother. I did not have my father in the picture, and I did not meet my dad until I was 27 years old. So. Obviously, there's a lot that goes into that. And a lot of the reasons I am the way I am is based on that experience that I dealt with growing up. But when all of my friends, Alan, went away to college after high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but I knew I didn't want to go to college. So Mm -hmm. I just started working while everybody else was out partying and meeting people and what seemed like living the dream. I was working at the local gas station from six in the morning until two in the afternoon. And that was my my full time job. And I ended up just job hopping around through my teens and my early 20s. And I ended up getting this very, very good job. 
where I was in the weatherization industry. So all that means is we would go into a building and we would make it more energy efficient. We worked in state and government buildings. So I got paid by the state and or the government. So I usually made really good money. Yeah. And thank you for the wonderful introduction. And as you mentioned in that introduction, when I was 25, I basically had what anybody could want. It's the, it was quote unquote, the dream life. I had a sports car. My girlfriend was a model. I literally had just done a bodybuilding show. So I was in the best shape of my life. I was making good money. Everything seemed like it was awesome, but I was very unconfident. I had a very low level of self-esteem. I had a very low level of self-worth. I was very self-conscious. I wasn't proud of who I was. And I was afraid of my own shadow, genuinely. Mm -hmm. One day, my girlfriend came to me. We lived together in New Hampshire. And she said, Kev, I want to move across the country to California. And I want to chase my dreams. And I gave her every reason in the world why she shouldn't do it this, 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 just a bunch of BS because I was afraid that she was going to leave me behind. Mm -hmm. And I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to keep up and my goals and my dreams weren't big enough. And she came back a couple of weeks later and we had a conversation and she said, I'm going to leave you. I need to go chase my dreams. I need to go do my thing. And you're not the man that I thought you were. And she ended up leaving me and, and chasing her dreams. I'm glad she did. That's exactly what she should have done. But when she left, that was my initial rock bottom. We had just moved in together three or four months ago, right? Now she's leaving. I have this place by myself. Work has gotten slow. So now I'm paying for everything by myself. I'm paying two, almost $3,000 a month in bills. And I'm not making $3,000 a month right now. So that was a really challenging time for me because I had to look in the mirror and realize I didn't like who I was as a man. That is when I initially started self-improvement. And I read some simple books and I got into that. But what I really did was I tried to get inside my own mind. So I would do these positive affirmations, Alan, every night before yeah. I went to bed. I'm talented. I'm handsome. I'm worthy. I'm intelligent. And this year, I'll make the most money I've ever made in my entire life. The problem is I leaned on that last one, assuming that would fix all of my internal problems. So the next year starts out, I get a promotion. I'm a foreman now at the company. And when you're a foreman, that means you start every job and you finish every job. So you're on the jobs for the entire time. Yeah. But we did most of our work out of state. So I lived in New Hampshire at the time. We did most of our work in New Jersey, which is like a six or a seven hour ride. Yeah. So if you fast forward to the end of that year, I had been on the road for 10 months out of the 12. Every single week I was living in hotels and these were not nice hotels. Mm -hmm. I was living out of my suitcase. So Monday, not even Monday, Sunday through Friday, I would be on the road. I'd come home Friday night. Sometimes I get home at like nine at night. Sometimes I get home at two in the morning. I would literally take my clothes out of my suitcase, throw them into the, the washer, take them out, throw them into the dryer, and then throw them back into my suitcase. That was literally how I lived life for those 10 months. But when we got to the end of the year, I slid open my pay stub and I made $100,000 at 26 with no college degree. And I remember I had another one of those moments of, oh, I put all of my emphasis for happiness into external results. I'm still miserable inside. Nothing changed. I'm still insecure. I'm still self-conscious. So I did what anybody does. I started a podcast called The Hyperconscious Podcast. That was how this all started for me. And I was having deep conversations with my friends about their lives. One of my friends debated suicide and I went to the hospital with him and we talked about that on the podcast. And it was powerful. Another one of my buddies had his first child when he was, I think, 19 or 20. And we talked about how that changed his life. And it was awesome. And I really felt like I was having an impact for the first time in my life. But the problem is work was just as busy and I didn't care about my job anymore. I didn't care about the money because I realized money didn't bring me happiness. I didn't care about traveling because I didn't want to do it anymore. It wasn't worth it to me. So I started calling out of work. I would show up late. I would leave the job site early, which people did not appreciate. And it got to the point, Alan, where I would have to be in New Jersey, which was seven hours away, six hours away, depending on traffic. On Monday morning at 7 a.m., I would sleep in my bed at home from 9 p.m. until like midnight. I'd get up and I'd drive six hours, seven hours to the job site. I'd work an eight-hour day and then I'd go to the gym after. And I was just burnt out. I was running on fumes. And 
the the rock bottom basement moment, the the day, the morning, the event that really shifted my life more than anything. I woke up in New Jersey, 5.15 in the morning, cold fall morning. I wake up and I slide to the edge of this hotel bed. And I'm six hours away from home. I have somebody else in the room with me who's a coworker, but you know this person isn't really a friend of mine. And the best way to explain it is there's 10 televisions on in my head at the same time. And every single one is on a different station. And one is saying, Kev, you're stuck here forever. I know you want to go do other stuff, but you're never going to find a job like this. You got very lucky to make the amount of money you're making. If you do leave, what will your friends think? You make more money than any of your friends and they all kind of look up to you. And you know, you're, you've positioned yourself as successful in your friend group. What will your family think? You make more money than anybody in your family. You can't do this. And the loudest one for me, Alan, was, do you really think you can be a successful podcaster? And genuinely, transparently, authentically, I did not believe that was possible for me. And in that moment, I felt like if I was to end my life, I would take my problems with me. And that wasn't the first time I had felt that. That was probably the, the third time. I've, I had been to therapy at that point, and I had done a lot of reflection. But I ended up texting my business partner, who was also named Alan, and I said, hey, I'm going through it. I'm dealing with these thoughts. I don't know what to do. I'm in a really dark place. And he said, Kev, so much has changed for you over the last couple of years, but your environments have stayed pretty much the same. I think it's time for you to, to change your environments. Three or four months later, I left my job, became a broke entrepreneur for the next three years, which was probably more challenging than the first part of my life, honestly. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really where it started for me. My goal is to be the person that I needed when I was sitting on the edge of that hotel bed. And that's one of the through lines of why I do the things I do. You know, that's why we're recording this on a Saturday when, you know, some other people are going to the beach. It's going to be 92 degrees today. I'd rather be here doing this because this is what I love. Oh, I hear you, brother. That's a great, great story. And thanks so much for putting all that context around, around the story. And is it so true that, you know, a couple of notes that I wrote down is it's about the external pieces of our life and how we, and then how we measure ourselves against that. And we feel, and we forget that it's really, it's an intern, it's an internal job. And one of the things I, I always say is that life's a do it yourself project. It doesn't mean do it by yourself. It means do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had the fortitude to at least be able to reach out to your business partner and, and, and get that and get that wake up call. The other piece that I note that I made that to hear was about how you measured success you know, and you had all these different things. And then it was the last one. It was the money thing. That'll make me better. That'll make me happy. You know, and that's how I'll determine that I'm successful and that I'm worthy. And I'm just wondering that through this time there, that's obviously something that, you know, a switch was flicked for you. So what was the first thing that after you, after you started to realize what was going on, what was the first thing you knew you had to change? And then how did you go about doing that? Mm. I knew that I had to tap into who I was as a human being to figure out. I think it was the understanding, Alan, that happiness is results-based. Mm -hmm. So if I do well at the gym today, I will be happy. Or if I do well at my speech, I will be happy. Or if I do well on this podcast, I will be happy. When the through line of what people are looking for, I think is fulfillment. I think it's contribution. Worst case scenario, I bomb this and it's terrible. And Alan says, hey, we can't publish that. It was, that was the worst thing ever. But I'm still in the process of doing what I love. I'm in alignment with the best version of Kevin. So I think that I had to unlearn the fact that money does not buy happiness. Money buys opportunity. It can buy you time. It can buy you some freedom. But it's not going to fill any voids inside of you. That is something that only you can do. And I think there's a couple of ways to do it. Ask yourself, why, why am I making these decisions? Why am I not making yeah. these decisions? But one of the things that I really believe is very important that not enough people talk about. And I just said the word unlearning. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us, Alan, when we're born, we're born into soil that might be toxic. We have no control over it. And five, 10, 15, 20 years later, our roots are still planted in that soil and we're still part of that seed. And we're learning and we're reading books like you have behind you. For some reason, it doesn't seem like it's landing. It's not getting to the identity level. It's not getting to the root. And I think the problem is a lot of us are pouring this new nutritious soil on old toxic soil. I think the thing that I understood that I had to do was I had to reflect and figure out why do I think the way I think? 
It's not based on what I did yesterday. It's based on what I've always done. So I really tried to take a look back into childhood, into why I was making the decisions I was making, into traumas, into fears, into successes, into pleasures, and really understand myself at a deeper level. Hyperconscious means acutely aware. Mm -hmm. Acutely aware of why things are the way they are, why they aren't. That was the biggest thing I did. I tried to change the way I thought, which changed the, uh, changed the way I acted, and then that would change the way I live. That was our motto for hyperconscious. Love it. Love that. You know, that's so true. And I really like that you use the term unlearning. It's one of the ways that we, we define in the Awaken Man, how we define wisdom is the ability to unlearn mm. something, right? Because when we come in with the idea that I've already, I already know this stuff, that's when we're not really, that's not, that's not really learning anything. And we're not, so we have to first take a moment to, you know, empty that cup to allow something new to come in so that we can gain some wisdom. And we get that through that practice. And I just mm. love that. And the other thing, you know, so synchronicity here, lots of synchronicity here with our conversation, because one of the things that changed for me in my life, uh, you know, some 25, 30 years ago, when I was going through my stuff, my first iteration of stuff was I came across the essence of destiny quote, you know, and it's about thoughts, words, actions, behaviors, ultimately prove your, your destiny. And I really like how you've honed in on that. And you were able to figure that out that how am I thinking about why am I thinking the way I'm thinking and how can I change that perspective, change that, that point of view that allows me to, to shape and change. And so I want to talk a little bit about then leading into like the difference between having a growth mindset or a fixed mindset, mm -hmm. what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely had a very, very, very fixed mindset for, I mean, up until 27. So I'm 32 now. So I've probably had a growth mindset for the last five years. Yeah. One of the best examples of this, I use this as a story. Yeah. Uh, I went to the fire academy. So at the time I lived in Massachusetts, I wanted to be a firefighter. Our town had an on-call position where they would send you to the on-call firefighting academy. I said, cool, let's do this. And one of the things that I never did is I never asked questions. So we would have classroom days where you would learn from the book and there'd be presentations, but we also had these practical days where we would do live fire training and we do hydrant training and engine training. And I remember I never asked any questions on the practical days because I was so afraid that people would laugh at me. So mm. afraid because a lot of the kids who were in that class with me, their parents were firefighters, their grandparents were firefighters. They'd already worked in houses before. And this was like my introduction. So I end up passing all my tests and I end up becoming an on-call firefighter. And the first week I was on call, my pager goes off at 2 a.m. And I go down to the station. It's like, whoa, this is, this is something. This is really, really interesting. This is exciting. I get on the engine, I get my gear on and we get to this, this fire and there's a car on fire in somebody's garage, uh, in somebody's driveway. Mm -hmm. And the second I get out of the truck, I think to myself, I have no idea what to do. I have no clue what, I don't know where this hose goes. I don't know where the inlet is, the outlet is. And I literally just froze. And if there was something major going on there, I might have been responsible for somebody not being saved. That was the last day I felt confident as a firefighter. I ended up quitting shortly thereafter. Reason is I had such a fixed mindset. I was so afraid to ask for feedback, to ask questions that that actually took me from that job. So one of my favorite quotes is, you're going to get feedback no matter what. You can either get it along the way or you can get it all at once at the end. I got it all at once at the end, but I always had a very, very fixed mindset. I assumed failure was final. I assumed if you failed something, it was the end of the world. And I think one of the ways to really untether yourself from that, number one, there's a book called Mindset by Carol Dweck, which is a great book about that. And she's done so much research on it. But I think that you have to set small, small, small goals for yourself and prove yourself right. And then when things do go wrong, which they naturally will, you just have to find the lessons. You have to find the lessons from your failures. And then when you try again, you know what to avoid at least. It's like a video game. The first level is usually one of the harder levels because you don't know what's going on. Yeah. But the second time you do that level, it's a little bit easier. Right. And then if you beat the game, it's easier to beat the game the second time. But if you quit on the first level, you never understand what happens on the second, third, fourth, and fifth. That's so true. And I just love the way you put that, you frame that whole piece. And isn't it so true that how 
again, it comes back to, I just keep thinking of, you know, the stories that we tell ourselves and how we, how we're measuring success and that, you know, if I don't have, if I, I just need to, I'll, I'll just know it all. So I'm not going to ask any questions. I'm not going to put myself out there. And there used to be a commercial, I'm up in Canada here in Winnipeg and, and there used to be a commercial on with a, with a guy with a, you know, a mechanic and he'd say, you can either pay me now, you know, get the small repair or you're going to pay me later, you know, with the big stuff. And, and how often as men do we out of fear, fear of being embarrassed, shamed, you know, we're talking about shame this month in, in our, in our work. It's just, it's amazing to me. To, and when I talk to successful people like yourself about how, once you realize that I'm by not asking questions and not putting ourselves out there and learning along the way, instead of waiting to the end to get the big learning in, and sometimes that's, that's productive, but for the most yeah. part, it suggests it probably just reinforces the lack of self-confidence that we have. Would you agree with yeah. that or? Yeah, I think that's the reason that I was so afraid to ask a question because I think my thought process at the time was, well, if somebody laughs at me, that's going to directly hit me in my identity and that's going to hurt my self-worth where now it's, I realize that, yeah, it might, I, maybe I will get laughed at, but I also know that I will be the one who feels more competent in the long run. So I think my awareness now of the question doesn't even matter. The awareness that comes with the answer and the fact that I can put that to practice later, it doesn't matter what happens in the interim, really. And that's something that's taken me a long time to, to really adopt. But it's also been me constantly getting out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Alan and I go to events, I always make it a point to try to ask a question. Even if I don't have one, I just make one up because I'm trying to teach myself, look, it's not bad. It's okay. And honestly, I'm a podcaster, so I'm actually pretty good at asking questions now. So that that helps. But I wonder if that came from the fact that I never wanted to ask questions in the past. Yeah, it could be, right? You, you know, the world works in different ways. And so right? choosing the idea you know, that I'm going to be a podcaster, you kind of put yourself out there similar to, you know, as I'm developing uh, this work, it was what's the best way to get the communication out there. And so I re really enjoy listening to podcasts. I thought, well, why don't we try that? I can talk mm -hmm. for a little bit. And, and I just love interviewing folks such as yourself, because you learn so much from, even though the stories may have some, like a grain of truth and similarity, the journey is so different. Like yeah. your journey is so different from, uh, from, from everyone else. And so I wanted to go back, take a little bit of step back though, and talk a little bit about mental health and the toll that it takes on people, especially for men, because the statistics for, for suicide for men is so high, like it's anywhere between four to five times that of women. And, and I just want to get your sense, uh, get a sense from you uh, that when did you notice that things were really starting to get, you know, that that was starting to become heavy for you? And what were the, you know, you talked about reaching out to, to Alan to, to mm -hmm. make a change, but what was going on for you? When did you start to notice? And how did you finally get yourself to take that action? The first time I ever had any inkling that I was having any mental health issues, I lived in Boston with uh, my girlfriend at the time. And we lived in this really nice apartment with this other couple. And we had the loft upstairs. And one day everybody was gone to work and I had the week off or something. And I remember laying in bed and I, I remember vividly thinking to myself, if this is what life is, I don't know if I want to do it. It wasn't, I wasn't having like suicidal ideations, but it was very much, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. This is just, it's gray and it's boring. And there's, I just don't feel fulfilled. And I just feel like I'm in groundhog day. I'm doing the same thing every single day. And I ended up telling my partner at the time and she suggested therapy. She said, well, I've been to therapy a lot. I think that's something that can, that can really help you. And I remember number one, we lived in Boston. So anywhere you go in Boston and you're trying to park, it's a nightmare. So I was like, look, I'm not going to go downtown and get therapy. This is going to be a whole thing. She ended up eventually convincing me. And I remember I went downtown to Boston. I found a parking spot, parallel parked. I walk into this old building and I'm walking up this spiral staircase, these creaky stairs. And I remember thinking, this is going to be terrible. This is going to be terrible. I'm going to cry. I'm going to look bad. And I remember when I walked in, uh, I had a female therapist she was amazing. She asked me great questions and we got deep and I definitely cried a lot. But I remember when I left there that day, I felt way better. I felt really, really good because I, I think that what I wanted to do deep down was I wanted to express the way I was feeling. I just wasn't sure or confident or certain that I could. And I think that when I had the opportunity to talk about my past and my feelings and my traumas, I think it made me feel better. 
And it went from me not wanting to do this to actually looking forward to doing it. And I ended up moving from Boston to New Hampshire. I found a therapist when I moved and then I got so busy with work that I couldn't keep up with it. But it was a very, very positive experience for me. And that was the first time I ever realized that I had any mental health um, struggles. That was the, the first one. I think my story is a little bit different because number one, I always said I will never go on medication. I'm not interested in it. I will figure it out myself. I'm stubborn like that. That's just how I am. Yeah. But when I left my job, that's kind of when it ended for me. Mm-hmm. Like that's kind of when it went away because I think I tapped into something greater than myself. I'm on a mission. So that's one of the things for me is I'm fulfilled. I get to do this every day. I have to grow if I want to have the level of impact that I'm aiming for. And my level of contribution, I mean, I get to podcast seven times a week. I podcast every single day. So my level of contribution is through the roof. So I feel like those are the needs that I I didn't have met back then that now are like that cup is overflowing. And I think that's for a lot of people where it comes from. I think that if you feel like you're doing the same thing over and over and over and you're not growing and you're not contributing and you're not impacting the world in your, your own unique way, you probably don't have that fulfillment. So I think that this journey has been in a way the best medicine for me that I could ever have, honestly. Yeah, I completely agree with that, with that mindset. And I just want to applaud you and thank you for, for sharing and, and of letting guys, letting guys know that it's okay to go out and seek help. You know, I did lots of therapy myself and did lots of work as well. And I think it's important that as men, sometimes we feel that we have this lone wolf idea and we're just going to yeah. do it by ourselves. And if you need that help to go ahead and, and, and find that. So I really appreciate you, you sharing with that. Can and I this, add to that, Alan? Yeah, hundred percent. I think that one of, I got a lot of quotes today. I don't know why Saturday quote day. One of my favorite quotes is the level of your relationship is directly correlated to the level of vulnerability in it. I think that's where particularly with men, it can be challenging because most of our relationships are not based on vulnerability. They're based on whatever they're based on. Maybe it's achievement or fitness or comedy or you know, ego, whatever it is, masculinity. So I would really, if you're out there and you're a man and you are struggling with expressing yourself, find somebody you feel comfortable being vulnerable with, because that is the key. Vulnerability does not make you weak. It makes you strong. It means you're strong. By definition, doing the difficult thing requires strength. Vulnerability is difficult, but it is not a weakness. It is, it is a superpower if you can be vulnerable and you can for sure. Absolutely. So, so true. And thank you very much for, for adding that because it is absolutely paramount in our, in our growth as men today. And we need to reshape and re remold what masculinity looks like, mm-hmm. what, uh, how we are, how we present ourselves. There's lots of challenges in that, in that arena. And we just need to be able to, to step out and, and make those changes. So you, you must, so obviously it's not, you're a very driven individual, you know, your guys are really successful with your work and we're going to get into that r- r- uh, shortly here. But what I wanted to touch on is, you know, give us, if you give us a sense of what your rituals or routines are like that you use, the practices you use on a daily basis, it keeps you on track to, so that you're achieving uh, your outcomes. Yeah. So I will, I always preface this with, this is my experience. I do not suggest necessarily that you do the same. Um, I live in a spreadsheet and I do the same 20 things every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and that's really what keeps me on track. I think that oftentimes we forget why we're doing what we're doing. Or one of my favorite thoughts is you forget how good of a dancer you were. And when you stopped dancing, you no longer become a good dancer. So it's like when you stop doing what got you to the dance, you lose the results it just helps me focus on the most important things. And at one point it was very constricting. It was like, I don't want to track my hat, check, check if you do it, no check if you don't do it. But yeah, for me, it started with doing five things a day and now I do 20 things a day. And, um, you know, I got it down to the point where I can do it in a couple hours. You know, that's why I do it every day. And that's really, really helped me. And people like oftentimes will say like, what are, what's an example? Um, what I say to people is if you've never tracked habits, I understand it can be challenging. It can seem very overwhelming. Start with one habit under health, one habit under wealth, one habit under love. Under health, when you wake up, just weigh yourself. That's all. You don't have to do anything crazy. You don't have to go on a 26-mile run. If you're just getting into this, just weigh yourself because at least it'll give you awareness. For wealth, when you wake up, look at how much money is in your bank account, write that number down, do the same thing tomorrow. 
is the number going down consistently or is the number going up consistently? What's the run rate look like, right? That's an important thing. And then for love, if you're in a relationship, you can play the gratitude game with your partner. So every night before my fiance and I go to bed, hey, uh, this is one thing I'm grateful for about you. And then the other person will reciprocate. If you're single and you don't have a partner, you can do the same thing. I mean, what's five things you're grateful for about your life? Maybe it's, you can do yoga, you can meditate, but I think a lot of us think that we have to conquer and climb the mountain overnight when realistically it takes years and years and years. I mean, I've been doing this for five years. I started with five habits and I missed all the time, right? Every single day I would get like, eh, I'm not going to do this thing. I'm not going to post on social media, whatever it may be. So that's really helped me stay focused, stay dialed in and honestly guarantee that I'm growing at the rate that I need to in order to ultimately get to the goal that we're trying to get to. But I also understand, Alan, it's not for everybody, right? Like yeah. it's, it's very regimented. It's very boring. There's, mm-hmm. I don't have a lot of variety, but I don't, that's not one of my core needs as a human really. So I think it, it works well for me. I understand that it's probably not for everybody. Yeah. I hear, I hear what you're saying, but you know what? Variety is overrated. Variety is <laughs> a perfect excuse to not get, not get stuff done. Fair. Right? fair you know right like uh and i'm and i'm saying this more to myself than i am to to my audience you know <laughs> oh i like to have a little bit of variety so uh yeah right but the, in any of the men's work that i've been following and looking at you're right on track and i really like that you have to it's really simple mm-hmm. you you started this whole this whole segment on i track it's simple right and it didn't need in today you're at 20 but like you said you started with five things yep. picked some items that are important in life you know, the, the circle of life idea and you just worked on it and you weren't successful at the beginning, but it was a way to get on track. And I think it's yep. important that, you know, that the listeners get that the simplicity of what you're doing. And while it may, it doesn't, I think the most profound things are just that, right. They're simple. They just, yeah. it doesn't need to be so complicated. And, and I just liked how you did, how you presented that. Thank you. The fundamentals aren't sexy. Usually, no, you know, it's just, they've been around for so long and, Yeah. I mean, if you want to become financially free and you don't know how much money is in your bank account, it's not going to happen most likely unless it's luck. So you need the awareness, even if you just track for awareness and then you can make a, you know, a decision to do something differently. But that's been instrumental in my success, my growth, our entire team tracks their habits, right? So like we're in this culture of excellence and obviously it's vulnerable excellence. You know, it's not, um, there's not a lot of ego in, in what we do, but I think it just helps and you feel good. You make small promises to yourself. You keep small promises to yourself. It helps your self-trust, your self-esteem, your self-worth. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what James Clear would say, right? Right. Talk about, right? Then what's the, what's the one thing, the one habit you can do? No, nope, that's too big. What make it small, yep. In, infinitesimally small. What can you, what can you do? So I really love that, uh, that piece. Let's talk a little bit about your work. So uh, I noticed that, so you have a podcast. I think I got the name right. It's Next Level Podcast Solutions. Is that correct? So Next Level University is our podcast. Next Level Podcast Solutions is one of our many businesses within the business. Right on. So tell tell us a little bit about Next Level University, how it came about and what what its mission is and how you're changing people's lives through the podcast landscape. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, I started a podcast by myself. It was called the Hyperconscious Podcast. When I left my job, Alan and I partnered up and we formed an LLC and we formed an actual company. And we said, we're going to be business partners. We were like, I don't know, 400 and something episodes in. And one of our mentors, you know, Evan Carmichael. I've heard the name. Evan Carmichael mentored us. And he said, I love you guys. You guys are great interviewers and you're like awesome, but I don't know what hyperconscious means. And nobody else does either. You need to change your name. And I was like, not going to happen, Evan. That will never happen. And then we ended up changing our name to Next Level University because obviously it makes more sense. Um, So yeah, we are a global top 100 podcast. We do seven episodes a week, listened to in 125 plus countries. And we actually just crossed our thousandth episode a couple of weeks ago. And one of the, I guess one of the best things and the best ways to put it, we want to take a heart-driven, but no BS approach to holistic self-improvement. So I think there's a lot of people out there who say, well, this is, here's five ways to make more money. Here's five ways to have a better relationship. Here's five ways to have a better body. But almost none of those people have all of the results. 
And we want to be holistic. We want to be well-rounded. And I want to give people real authentic advice through my own experiences and my stories. I will never tell you it's easier than it is. I think that's doing people a disservice because if you start something and you realize it's way harder than you thought, you're, you might internalize that as, well, I suck. I'm not good. I'm not smart, whatever. I try to just give the truth. And then the, the no BS part is, is that. I'm going to call you out on your stuff. Please call me out on my stuff. I just want everybody to grow at the, at the fastest rate possible. So that is our brand in a nutshell. And that is what I love to do every single day. Yeah, I was looking on your website. Now you have such phenomenal resources there for people. There's free stuff. There's you know the work. You have the podcast community, which uh, I'm considering looking at joining as well. It looks like you guys just have really put some great stuff together to help entrepreneurs take that next step. And so obviously you didn't get there by fluke. So tell me why, why you think consistency is so important that's gotten you where you are today. Yeah, because very little can be accomplished. Number one, very little can be accomplished in a day. Number two, very little can be accomplished if you miss. So I think a lot of people only see where they are today and they don't understand, well, if you put one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, in front of the other for long enough, you'll end up in somewhere completely different. It can be a completely different world, really, depending on how, how many steps you take. So one of the biggest things is without consistency, your day-to-day -day is going to stay pretty much the same. And the reason you're going to make progress in life is based on what you do on the day-to-day. -day. So if you were to smoke one cigarette right now, nothing's going to change, most likely. If you are going to track one habit right now, most likely nothing is going to change. But if you fast forward 10, 15, 20 years, that's when you see the drastic changes. So consistency is, in my opinion, the most important thing in the world because it's really the only way to make progress. And we, we have a lot of public accountability because we say this all the time, but one of the reasons we are where we are is because we don't miss episodes. We won't. It's, it's a non-negotiable. It's a non-negotiable for us. So the things that you do the most consistently, you will get the best results in. It just is that way. I didn't make up the rule. It's just the way it works. And I think a lot of us now more than ever with the landscape of social media, we've been convinced that we can kind of just show up when we want. And I don't believe that. I, I genuinely don't believe that. I don't think that's the way to build a business or a community or a life or a relationship or success. So yeah, I think it is, it's being talked about more and more now. James Clear has done an amazing job talking about habits and consistency. Um, but it's one of those things where it doesn't seem to pay off until it does. And then when it pays off, you realize, oh, okay, cool. I've been doing this for the right reason the whole time, but not everybody has the opportunity to have that realization. Yeah, for sure. And, and, or the fortitude to stick it out long enough to see the fruits yeah. of their labor, right? We, it's so easy for us to give up because we keep in mind, you know, the end goal. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to get to that thousand, you know, the thousand episode. Well, it starts with one. Mm -hmm. And then it's 10 and then it's 20. And it's just to, to stay in the, to stay in the moment and be consistent. And I just like, I really like how you put that. Thank you. So listen, of everything that we've talked about today, and maybe there's something we didn't get a chance to talk about, what would you, would you recommend would be one takeaway for our listeners? It's going to be another quote, Alan. I don't know why you got me, you got me quoting today. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and I think I made this up, but I'm sure some human throughout, you know, history has said it. They put these words together in this order. Your reality becomes the parts of your imagination that you hold on to and pour into the longest. So when I started a little podcast by myself on episode seven, I said my goal was to wake up when I want, go to sleep when I want, go to the gym when I want. Alan asked me when I go to the gym, usually in the morning. Um, podcast with amazing people and be my own boss. That was my goal. Be my own boss and do this for a living. And here we are a thousand episodes later. And now that is my reality. Now, that's the thing I held on to and I focused on and I poured into and I worked every single day at. But it's also the thing that I tried. I didn't always, but I tried to believe was possible. I held on to that part of my imagination. What would it be like if I could just podcast from home? If I could have my own studio at my house, what would that be like? What would it be like to have a bunch of clients? What would that be like to be financially free, to do all those things? So I really believe that when we get older, oftentimes we lose parts of our imagination, but that's where a lot of your dreams and your goals are. And if you can hang on to the ones that mean the most to you, you're at least more likely to accomplish them. 
I can't guarantee you will. I mean, if one of my, you know, one of the things I was imagining is I'm going to beat Michael Jordan in basketball or Wayne Gretzky in hockey, probably not going to happen. That's not in the cards for me, but there are certain things that if you do hold on to, you can accomplish depending on what your unique skill set and commitment level is. And that's so true. Thanks for nailing that. They just nailed it in the end there. It's about our unique honing in on our unique yeah. skill set. Cause we're not, all of us will be a Michael Jordan, Wayne Gretzky, right. Right. you know, or whomever we, we may look at. And that's so important. So I just want to say thank you so much, Kevin, for spending time with me today. Of course. You guys are doing such fantastic work with individuals, helping them to find their purpose. And we shed a little bit of light on mental health and that you're being a, truly you're being a beacon for others. And, and so I just want to have one final question. We go, how would our audience get a hold of you, contact you, join your, join your community, get involved with your work? Yes. Thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, you can find us next level universities. Just search that on any of the podcast platforms. We're also on YouTube. Our website is nextleveluniverse.com, And that has everything you need to know. And then if you want to chat with me, the best place is Instagram. My handle is at never quit kid. I do all my own DMS and all my own social media. So I will get back to you. And usually I try to send a video a custom video to everybody that follows me. Nice. Well, I'm going to make sure that all of that information is in the show notes so people can get out, reach out, get a hold of you guys and get involved with your work. You guys are doing fun, phenomenal stuff. So thank, thank you, you for being on the show. Of course. I appreciate you. Thank you. It was wonderful. You're a wonderful human and uh, I'm very grateful you're doing the work you are. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Revolutionary Man podcast. Are you ready to own your destiny? To become more the man you are destined to be? Join the brotherhood that is The Awakened Man at theawakenedman.net and start forging a new destiny today.